Benvenuti. Velko. Welcome. Uh, I'm Tom Rankin, American architect, living here in Rome for the past 30 years or so. And I'm speaking to you from the Teatro di Marcello, the Theater of Marcellus. Why here, of all the places in the city of Rome where students come every year to explore and understand ancient history and present day sustainability? Why, of all these places, do I, do I think? This is the best place to begin an exploration of the world's most resilient city. I'll be telling you more, but first let's go back to my studio. While the lessons of Rome are infinite, I'm most interested in how we can use Rome as a laboratory for sustainable design to help us make better cities around the world. I'm not talking about the classical style of architecture, which adorned empires, not unlike modernism in the 20th century. Even Roman architect Vitruvius realized that architecture should adapt itself to place, that a building in the north should be fundamentally different from a building in the south of the empire near the equator. When I studied architecture at college, it was mostly about buildings, about their materials, their forms, their language. Today, since then, we've learned that cities are mostly about the processes that occur over time, about the flows of people, of resources, of energy, of information, uh, increasingly of digital data. When we talk about sustainable cities, we're really talking about our ability to live well in a city without compromising future generations' ability to live as well, if not better, than ourselves. Rome has been undergoing this kind of transformation and change for over 2,000 years. So I can think of no city better suited to study resilience and sustainability than Rome. In the archaeological parks of Rome, where I've had the privilege of excavating alongside Roman archaeologists, we often find the remnants of ancient buildings stripped of their cladding, devoid of life. True, this is often compensated for by rich vegetation and a kind of romantic, picturesque setting, which we all love. But when we ask the question, what happened to the missing pieces, the answer isn't just, well, nature took its course. These buildings didn't just decay over time. When you go into a church like Santa Maria in Cosmodon or Santa Maria in Trastevere, your eyes are drawn to the floor made of elaborate marble mosaics or maybe to the columns, fine marble examples, but not necessarily all the same. These are examples of medieval ingenuity, of reuse, or what today we call upcycling. The artisans of the Cosmati family, people like Jacopo Cosmati, who signed his name on this mosaic on the Celian Hill, were skilled in removing broken marble slabs from ancient Roman temples and palaces, cutting them into small pieces and reassembling them into new works of art, especially floor and wall coverings. But even during the Renaissance, the visitor to Rome, people like architects Brunelleschi from Florence or Baldessari Peruzzi from Siena, could find and document in their sketches marble sheathing on the walls and floors of imperial palaces. It's ironic that at exactly the same time when the appreciation of the classical world reemerges in the Italian Renaissance, the greatest amount of damage was done to its material heritage. Hundreds, if not thousands of square meters of marble cladding were stripped from ancient sites and reinstalled, or you might say upcycled, in churches like St. Peter's. There are some great exceptions. The Pantheon, rather than being ransacked and stripped of its materials to build churches, had already become a church in the early 600s. It was upcycled intact, and thus it is the best preserved classical building in Rome, if not the world. It's not surprising that some of the greatest Renaissance architects and artists chose to gather here in the Accademia dei Virtuosi, which is still active today, or to be buried in the ancient temple-turned-church, uh, people like Raphael, but also the less famous Sienese architect I already mentioned, Baldessari Peruzzi. Peruzzi arrived in Rome in the early 1500s. He collaborated with Raphael, on painting projects, frescoes in the Villa Farnesina, for example, where Peruzzi also did the architecture. But the real reason that Baldessari Peruzzi is my favorite Renaissance architect is his admirable ability to work with the heritage of the past, not to demolish ancient buildings, but to reuse them in new ways. 
One example you can see here was the Odium, a Roman theater for musical works, whose curving wall Peruzzi used as the foundation for the Palazzo Massimo alle Colonne. And Peruzzi brings us back here to where we started, the theater of Marcellus. In addition to the Odium, several stadia, and of course the amphitheater later known as the Colosseum, there were three great theaters for dramatic performances in the center of Rome. This is the best preserved of the three. The theater was first planned by Julius Caesar to upstage the earlier theater of Pompey nearby, built by his rival. At the time of Caesar's assassination, the theater was left incomplete, so Augustus finished it and dedicated it to his recently deceased nephew, Marcellus. The theater of Marcellus is part of the nearby Portico d'Ottavia, which was one of Rome's ancient exhib exhibition spaces and uh, in the Middle Ages turned marketplace. Today, this is the main drag of Rome's Jewish community, the former Jewish ghetto. It seated over 20,000 spectators, was decorated with the three orders, the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, just like the Colosseum would be a century later. What makes this building more interesting than its more famous successor, though, is uh, that rather than just being given over to tourists as a place to be visited, the Theater of Marcellus is still in use for everyday life. In the Middle Ages, it was still in pretty good shape, despite centuries of small-time plundering. And the theater was taken over by the Pierleone family and used as their family fortification, their stronghold. Then in the 1300s, it passed to the Savelli family, who hired Peruzzi to build them a new palace in the 1500s, thinking to compete with the emerging Renaissance palazzi that were popping up in Italian cities everywhere. They probably assumed that their architect would propose leveling the site and constructing a conventional building. But Peruzzi pointed out how it would be not only more cost-effective to build upon the old theater, but it would give them greater status, a direct connection back to the classical world. So now I'm at the rear entrance, the entrance into the gardens, where the former auditorium of the theater once was. And in the 1700s, after Peruzzi had built the palace for the Sabelli family, it passed hands several times. It was taken over by the Orsini family in the 1700s. Uh, their symbol you can see in the little bears up here. Orso means bear. And this is today uh, home to a number of illustrious residents, including the embassy to the Vatican of the Knights of Malta. In the 20th century, most of the palazzo belonged to the Cayetani family, who helped hide refugees from the nearby Jewish community during the Nazi occupation. Interestingly, another resident in the post-war years, who had also been active in the resistance, but in this case in Tuscany, was English-born writer Iris Origo. And the story gets even more interesting, although I don't have time to go into it now, bringing together connections to two of the most beautiful gardens in Italy, made by Origo in Tuscany and the Cayetani family south of Rome at Nympha, but also reconnecting to the Orsini family, who I'm told purchased Iris Origo's apartments in the palazzo just a few years ago. Then in the 1930s, when Mussolini's fascist regime decided to excavate this general area to bring it back to ancient ground level in order to use this trafficking boulevard for processions, they restored the exterior of the theater, they reinforced it with a brick wall here, and inserted into that wall the fascist symbol. When we set out earlier, we were asking the question, why a place like the Theater of Marcellus can teach us lessons today about how we live in cities and how to make cities more sustainable. I think um, it's clear that the greenest building is the one that's already there. If we can regenerate our historic cities, we can do so consuming less energy, um, leaving less damage to the environment, and in fact, learning from the, the layers of history to live better when we go back to our own cities. So I think that sustainable tourism should be spreading its wealth widely to some of these lesser known sites, rather than concentrating in places like the Colosseum, whose lessons I think are better told in the, the theater of Marcellus. So I'm an advocate for slow tourism, for slow architecture, for doing what Peruzzi did, recognizing the value of the heritage which has come down to us and finding ways to 
upcycle it, to transform it, to regenerate it, and to keep it going for future generations. So I hope that students who come to Rome, when the pandemic is over and they start to return, they will return with a, a renewed sense of respect for the past, but not as something to be kept in a museum, something to be reused to improve our lives today and the lives of the planet. Mm -hmm.